Hi, everybody. I am so pleased to be here this evening to talk about the four pieces that Roman Rabinowitz will be playing in his recital on November the 19th. He's beginning the program with a big Haydn sonata, followed by an original piece of his that I have not yet heard, his sonatina, he completed this year. Then we'll hear Debussy Estamp, followed by Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata. So I will talk a little bit about all four of the pieces, although I can't say too much about Rubinovich's uh, own sonatina, um, but I'll probably focus the most on the Debussy and the Beethoven um, and the, on the second part of the program. So he opens our program this evening with Haydn's final piano sonata. And this is a piece that Haydn wrote and well completed in the year 1794 during an extended st stay in the city of London. When Haydn was in London, he was acquainted with a very well-known pianist named Therese Janssen, and he dedicated this sonata to her. Um, he also dedicated um, the big C major sonata, which is in the same group of pieces he wrote together to her as well, which sounds like this. So those are two, uh, this one, the E-flat and the C major, are two of his best known, grandest, largest solo piano sonatas. I think the story of his dedicatee is very, very interesting, and it tells us something about the nature of this piece. Janssen was German-born, but she had come to England with her father in her youth, and she began studying the keyboard with Clementi, who was really very, very famous, very, very illustrious teacher of the time. Um, and she was clearly a great virtuosa. We know that in part because several composers besides Haydn wrote pieces for her to play that are very, very difficult. So Haydn wrote these two sonatas as well as some other works, but Dushek and Clementi both wrote pieces for her um, that are quite virtuoso in their nature. And if you look at an encyclopedia of her time, it calls her, um, along with um, Clementi's other pupil, John Field, it calls the two of them his most distinguished piano pupils, um, really putting her in very illustrious company, which I think attests to her own considerable skill. Nevertheless, Janssen wasn't known to have played any public concerts during her time, we have started to learn about a little bit of public concertizing that she did. But it's most likely that she typically played in private homes um, or in kind of salon style venues, sort of poised on the precipice between public and private venues. And that's because she was a woman. Um, she was a woman moving in society and it really wasn't considered appropriate um, to be a public performer for money. When she got married, which was the year after this piece was completed, 1795, Haydn actually was a witness at her wedding, but the marriage was ill-fated, it didn't work out, and when she got divorced, uh, Janssen became a single mom. She had two kids and she supported them by mostly by teaching piano lessons in her home. So a very remarkable person, a friend of Haydn. I think when we look at this piece, um, and I'll say something a little bit similar about um, Rabinovich's own sonatina, but I think it's always really interesting to think about a piece and its dedicatee. Um, often, I think a piece of music can serve as kind of a portrait of the person for whom it's written. Um, and portraits, as you see down here, of women at the piano were, of course, very common in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, musical portraits can also tell us a lot about a person. So when we see a visual portrait, we think about their character and we know something about their wealth and about their temperament, but music does that too. Um, and so when you hear the E-flat major sonata, you will see that it's a reflection of her skill that I mentioned. It is showy, it is bravura in its nature, but it's also a piece that adapts itself well to the salon setting. It's incredibly jovial and good-natured. It um, sort of abounds with musical sociability. And I think that likely reflects Janssen's personality as well, as somebody with a wide circle of friends, someone gregarious and easy to get along with, um, much like Haydn himself. 
So let's hear just a little bit of the opening movement here. And I brought in a recording of it being played on a replica of a 1798 Clementi pianoforte. So this gives us some idea of what it might have sounded like um, back at the time when Janssen herself was playing it. talk a bit here about the sonatina. So as I mentioned, I haven't seen it yet. Um, but as I was saying with um, the Haydn, I think it's really interesting to think about who a person, a composer, writes a piece for. And in the case of this work, of course, it is a pianist composer writing a piece where we can assume he imagines he will be at least its first performer and maybe um, its primary performer for some time. Uh, Rabinovich told us a little bit about the work. He said that he composed the sonatina as an homage to the pieces of music that he loves and that its movements all look back to classical forms. He mentioned um, that the second movement includes a distorted lullaby, which sounds as though it's being heard from afar. And he also said that the third movement enacts the act of putting a child to sleep and that it includes some sort of fun moments of musical representation. There is a duet between a child and a stuffed animal, and also some hiccups, a case of the hiccups. Again, I haven't heard it yet, so I will be listening for these things with you. But I think, um, think about sort of the piece as a personal reflection, and you can think about the work as being something that looks backwards um, to pieces uh, that um, Rodin Rich knows and grew up with. And I also think it's really important to think physically about how a pianist composer might write a piece of music for himself. What are his skills at the keyboard? What does he do particularly well? Is he a great melodist? Is he great at control in the left hand? Just like when we look at Liszt and we talk about, oh, he must have been really good at those rapid parallel octaves. Well, what is it for Rabinovich? So you can kind of see the music as a physical portrait of what he does at the keys. And I think also, that those um, comments he made about the second and third movements, to me anyway, they suggest that he has a little bit of a purposeful connection to Debussy's Estampe, which follows the sonatina on the program. Estampe is a piece that Debussy completed in 1903. Its title means prints or engravings, um, but if you think about what the movements are about, I tend to think of it as having something to do with sort of like almost being like musical postcards. We have the first movement, which is meant to evoke the sounds of East Asia um, called Pagode. And the second movement, uh, La Soirée dans Grenade, which is meant to um, conjure up Grenada for us. Um, we'll hear a little bit of those too. The first, Pagode uses the pentatonic scale, trying to sort of give you a sense of the sounds of Asia. That's something that Debussy did commonly. We have stories about him having heard um, Indonesian music at the World's Fair and being very much inspired by that. We also are so accustomed, I think, in our culture to hearing pentatonic music and in it and its association with the representation of Asia because that's something that film composers still do in their scores very frequently. Um, it's just a magical opening. Let's hear a little of it. And then La Soirée d'Engrenade, we'll hear um, how he's trying to evoke Spain in his use of rhythm in particular in this movement. Thank you. 
I'm going to stop it there just in the interest of being concise, but much, much more to come in that movement. We're only at the very start. And then the third movement, um, Jardin sous la pluie, or Gardens in the Rain. I read in the notes um, that were circulated before this recital um, the comment um, of how the first two movements of this piece of a stomp are like a musical journey, but this third movement evokes France, so it's somebody staying home or Debussy staying home. And I like that, although I also think perhaps all three movements are really journeys in the imagination. And um, this third movement is maybe the sound of the or the visions that someone has as they look out at the garden in the rain, um, but maybe they're having memories, they're experiencing memories. And W.C. uses one of the great markers of musical memory, which is that he quotes um, two songs from childhood, um, two well-known French uh, children's songs. The first of those is called Dodo l'enfant do, meaning sleep, child, sleep. And it is, of course, a lullaby. Um, the folk song sounds like this. When it occurs uh, in the movement, it is in this kind of hazy atmosphere way up in the soprano range um, and just emerging out of this very um, fast moving texture that we've had uh, throughout the movement. And then the second um, folk tune or children's tune that Debussy uses in the movement is called Nous n'irons plus au bois, meaning we'll not return to the woods. And it sounds like this in its original form. Again, when it occurs during um, Gardens in the Rain, it's in the context of all of this atmosphere, so hazy and foggy, and it sort of emerges from the texture. Again, I think Debussy is trying to evoke the feeling of memory. Um, this person who is looking out the window, maybe it's not a child looking at the window, but rather somebody remembering being a child um, as they sort of uh, look out and there these images are evoked in their mind. So it sounds like this. So listen for uh, those tunes emerging for us as you hear uh, the whole movement. And let's talk about the Beethoven a little bit. So the final piece on the program is Beethoven's very famous Appassionata Sonata. This was written in that famous first decade of the 19th century where Beethoven was at the at really at his peak. Um, this is when he wrote his third symphony, a famous premiere of his fifth and sixth symphonies, um, many of his most famous piano works, pieces like the Waldstein and the Passionata are from that time. So this is heroic Beethoven um, and we hear a lot of the markers of his style in this sonata um, from that time period. I have been thinking about the Appassionata myself um, because I've done research on um, archival research on Myra Hess, who organized concerts at the National Gallery in England, in London, during the Blitz. And this was one of the pieces that she played there um, during the concerts and that she was most sort of associated with during her career as a concert pianist. Um, there was a lot of Beethoven played at those concerts, and Beethoven was very important <laughs> to the London audiences during the war. And I think when you listen to a piece like this, it's easy to see how the heroic style could really give um, 
some encouragement to people in a time of war that there's this kind of struggle to triumph narrative that happens in this piece um, and it is just absolutely unrelenting the whole sonata especially the first and the third movements in the first movement um, we have a pretty magical opening um, Beethoven uh, famously gives us this tune played in um, with the hands um, in unison and after the tune, the first phrase opens, he just magically lifts the tune up and places it a half step higher. It's not really functional harmony. It's just this, this real sense of kind of um, a moment of musical magic um, that I think is the whole character of the opening movement um, just makes it very special. So let's hear that opening. heard there that little motive reminds us a bit of the fifth symphony uh, opening in Beethoven and this kind of portentous motive uh, that reoccurs the coda of this movement is very famous it's a real mad dash to the end um, we'll see something similar end the entire sonata but let's hear a bit of that <laughs> The second movement is a great example of Beethoven writing a Johnny one note kind of melody. Um, it's the most beautiful tune, but if you think about what's happening melodically, there's not much to it. It reminds me a little bit of the slow movement of the seventh symphony, which is kind of similar in terms of being a pretty static melody, but having very rich harmony. Um, hear a bit of that first. So the tune that um, he casts a set of variations on in this movement um, similarly is sits on one note rather a lot, um, but it has very, very rich harmony. Here it is. That's the first half of it. Beethoven uses a really wonderful technique in this movement. So as I said, it's a set of variations. That's the theme that we're listening to. And the theme is essentially written all in quarter notes. When we get to the first variation, it's the same tune, it's moving at the same speed, but now he subdivides into eighth notes. So our pulse goes up. Our pulse um, multiplies itself by two. You'll hear that here. The second variation is in 16th notes for its pulse. Third variation, 32nd notes. And then the theme comes back. And it's a, such a sense of return, um, very momentous to come back to our just slow, pulsing quarter notes.
and then the third movement. And the second movement spills right into it. And like uh, the first movement, it is unrelenting. It is a sense of struggle and also of triumph over that struggle. I'll try to cover up the sunlight coming in. Um, and uh, it's just really a mad dash through. Um, let's hear a bit of that. and a bit of the coda. So enjoy this program. I know that I will, um, and I hope I've given you a few things to think about as you listen. Bye-bye, everybody.